I'll introduce uh, Mark Schoenemann, who is a PhD candidate at uh, Exeter uh, University. And I'll leave it at that to give you more time. If you know where, what this song is, or who it's by, just put your hand up, and when, when I ask Finn kindly to stop the song, then we can ask you whether you got it right. So, uh, Finn, could you, could you play the song, please? Your home is where you're happy. It's not where you're not free. Your home is where you can be what you are Cause you were just born to be Now let me show you that castles and diamonds for all to see But they'll never show you that peace of mind Cause they don't know how to be free So burn No one Bob Dylan, that's Charles Manson, the serial killer. So burn all your bridges, leave your whole life behind. You can do what you want to do because you're free in your mind and anywhere you might wonder. You can make that your home just so long as you've got love in your heart, you'll never be alone. Just so long as you've got love in your heart, you'll never be alone. You'll never be alone. That's quite frightening. <laughs> so, I'd like you to keep this in your mind while I talk about the rest of this presentation, which in many ways represents a critique of the counterculture from 1972 novel. The 1972 novel, The Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman. To critique a critique takes panache, and Angela Carter had plenty. This paper will unpack Angela Carter's critique of the psychedelic counterculture while showing you loads of strange images, like this one by Leonora Carrington, who I, Angela Carter writes in the same way as Leonora Carrington paints. So I thought synesthetically this, this might be a nice way for you to just focus on these images while I speak. But the infernal design machines of Dr. Hoffman, it imagines a South American town besieged by a maddening scientist whose machines manifest people's deepest wants as multisensory hallucinations. It follows the mission of a mestizo double agent from the Ministry of Determination, tasked with finding the mysterious Dr. Hoffman. The determination police is a pun, exposing both their role as determiners of the real and their single-minded determination to get the job done. But unlike the blue meanies of Yellow Submarine, if anyone's watched that, Carter's anti-hero, Desiderio, illustrates the complicated relationship between want and need, power and greed, ire and desire. Desiderio's fantastical encounters on his quest to find the origin of hallucination invigorate both convincing characterizations and a narrative essay on the relationships between machine, media, perception, authority, liberty, freedom to, freedom from, reality, and imaginary. But the literary analysis of the name Dr. Hoffman has so far only focused on Proust's Albertine and the author of the morality tales of Struvelpeter, the secondary literature has so far neglected to situate the book in the political wranglings of the 60s and 70s, 60s and 70s counterculture. For our psychedelics also not desire machines? And so this Easter egg is what my talk is based on. What if Albert Hoffman's LSD was the nanotechnological and imaginal desire machine which Angela Carter tries to depict in this book? There are a lot more than that, 
I'm not saying this is an exhaustive analysis. There's also a lot about media, post-truth, all that kind of stuff. But as a critique of the counterculture, this hasn't been done. So I'm going to connect the Hoffman of Carter with the Hoffman of LSD. And that punctures this kind of implosive hope, uh, which, which was the bad trip at the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s. So the diabolical Dr. Hoffman of Carter's novel perhaps is more closely related, if we really look at historical events, to people like Charles Manson or Nixon's paranoid vision of Leary as the most dangerous man in America. But I take Dr. Hoffman and his daughter, Albertina, you can't make it up, Albertina Hoffman, to be a metonym for LSD, the counterculture, and the anti-structure which this led to. So I'm going to start off with a synopsis and use that as a springboard to discuss how it represents a critique of the countercultural critique, so, um, as well as one of modern media and hedonistic consumerism and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to try and stay focused on the psychedelic theme. So the two themes I'd like to pick out after I give you a short synopsis are cognitive liberty and disintegration. So the whole novel can be seen through this Freudian lens, basically. There's this reality principle, and there's wish fulfillment. And you have the minister of determination, who is the kind of represents the measurable, the bureaucratic, and Dr. Hoffman, who represents the fantastical, the, the, the immeasurable. Um, but she's always collapsing these binaries. So to our synopsis first. The book's contextualized as a memoir by our protagonist, who's called Desiderio. He's looking from a later time as a regretful hero. He begins by describing how the hallucinations started. They were innocent at first, but with an unsettling tendency to respond to the human desire for novelty, history, and wish fulfillment. So walnuts start tasting like strawberries, chimney pots start talking, pilgrims return from a distant past, dead loved ones start coming back to life for a night of yearned for lovemaking, but the Minister of Determination is convinced that Hoffman's will is being imposed upon everyone else's trip. And so he sets up the Determination Police as a kind of counter-trip, almost. And that's ironic. So this destabilization has led to a situation where there's no food left in the city, the infrastructure is collapsing, people revert to their private reveries, to their closed-off cosmologies of desire. And Desiderio is tasked by the Minister of Determination, who is the only one who cannot see the hallucinations, to assassinate the person that they know to be the source of the visions, Dr. Hoffman. And Desiderio is chosen because although he can see the visions as they unfold, unlike the minister, he does not believe in them like everyone else does, until he sees Albertina for the first time. So Desiderio walks this fine line between the willing suspension of disbelief and wry skepticism that we find, as Eric Davis described earlier, in psychedelic culture, this jump between the sacred and the profane, belief and disbelief. And this is why, we learn at the end, he regrets his status as a veteran hero. Albertina Hoffman becomes his driving force, for though he pursues his job of finding the doctor through the hallucinatory marvels that follow, with the dispassionate rationality of relative ease, when he receives visions of her, even while he questions her veracity, these are visions which result in the never before experienced and the passionate urge just to meet someone. So this contrasting motivation in the protagonist between the cold and outward professional as a double agent of the determination police and the warm inner passion which questions the reality of love, this peppers the book with a very inverted irony. It's not so much that the Ministry of Determination and his determination police symbolize the cold rationality of the superego and Dr. Hoffman and his daughter and their entourage of projections, the animal passions of the id, though this is sometimes how it looks. For the minister is the only one who cries in the book, and he cries when the cathedral explodes. And when you actually get to Dr. Hoffman's castle, it's a very, very well-run kind of bourgeois bureaucratic machine. <laughs> the desire to disintegrate consensus reality by Dr. Hoffman is, actually, uh, is led by a kind of cold clinical brutality. 
Um, and the need to determine by the determination police, though expressed violently, is motivated by the love of institutions and of group life. But this is just the first irony. So in preparing this, I wrote a 600-word synopsis, but there's not enough time, so I had to delete that. And I'm going to just take, zoom you through Desiderio's journey. So he gets framed for a crime and wanted by his own police, so resulting in this misdetermination. He escapes this backfire by winding up among boat-living natives. But after being prepared for a wedding and going native himself, his paranoia grows that their myths imply that he will be sacrificed somehow. Then, posing as an agent of Hoffman's among a circus troupe, with remarkable similarities to Ken Kesey's acid tests, a troupe which, by the way, becomes more and more transgressive as the society which they moves through becomes more puritanical, this earthquake cataclysm destroys the circus troupe, and he hitches a ride with this hedonistic and sadistic count, whose concierge turns out to be Albertina in disguise. So subtle are the inversions that Albertina thinks the count is the minister in disguise, and Desiderio thinks the count is Hoffman in disguise. So cold and rational is his hedonism. But just before Desiderio and Albertina can consummate the realization that she is in fact enfleshed and not just a vision, not just a phantom of his desire, they're interrupted by the machine gun fire of the determination police, and they escape again, and after other adventures, the Count ends up being boiled by the embodiment of his own shadow. So, <laughs> before you think this is turning into an episode of Scooby-Doo, yeah. <laughs> fasten your seatbelts. In their blissed-out escape as a couple from the bondage of the Count, Desiderio and Albertina wind up with a bunch of very pious centaurs. These centaurs, right, live and breathe their myths in a constant and eternal ritual structure. Everything they do is ritualized. But they have never seen humans before, and so they consider themselves mutant horses, which have been disturbed by some kind of original bad decision. So Albertina and Desiderio are on the verge of this innovated ritual which the centaurs have developed. Right? They're confused, they're ruffled, and so they're going to nail horseshoes to their feet. And they manage to escape again into one of Dr. Hoffman's helicopters while the totem horse tree is left burning to the ground. And the final chapter details how exactly the hallucinations are formed. And we're led through a bizarrely ordered castle surrounded by it, uh, this, these technological emission devices, which compounds the symbol of Dr. Hoffman, not just as a symbol of the hallucinogenic counterculture, but also of the post-truth media, um, which calls to mind Walter Benjamin's statement in the Arcades Project. The advertisement is the ruse by which the dream forces itself on industry. Therefore, what Desiderio realizes is that Hoffman's castle is actually a huge disappointment. The man who makes dreams come true, who has found the key to the inexhaustible plus, does not live in a house of unreason, but merely a house of incomprehensible logic. And Desiderio, after a very bourgeois supper with the doctor and, and, um, and the corpse of the doctor's wife, which is another irony, and, and Albertina, is led to a place at once utopian and dystopian, a panoply of bubbles where people are doing nothing but living in eternity. This is the place where the eroto energy that generates the hallucinations comes from. And these people in these bubbles, it's a bit like the Matrix, they're just making love ad infinitum. And Desiderio is left with a choice, to join the engine, to become another cell in the battery of eroto energy, or to kill the doctor and restore the world to consensus reality. So it's a question of a pig satisfied or Socrates dissatisfied. As Desiderio puts the choice, I have been given the casting vote between a barren yet harmonious calm and a fertile yet cacophonous tempest, a night of perfect ecstasy in exchange for a lifetime of contentment. These matrix like pods are not merely overwrought allegories for the sexual libido, but also for a fully automated culture of easy, finger-flicking pleasure 
which keeps everyone asleep to the reality of the other and the inevitable contest with that reality, which we call consensus. Allegories in this novel spin around their tail and catch you unawares, and before I connect this strange story to the 60s counterculture, I must answer the question, what was the counterculture? What was it countering, exactly? So, the first theme here is cognitive liberty. The doctor wants the freedom to give people the hallucinations of their desires, and the minister wants the freedom from being or having society be put on the doctor's trip. But ironically, what this means in countercultural terms is everyone being put on the minister's bureaucracy trip. So even if the dreams are sinister phantoms in the form of tactile lies, everything has to be given reality ratings by the determination police. Now, I live in a country where quite still vaguely proudly, we don't have to have ID cards or, or the legal requirement even to carry identification around in public. But I, I, I'm guessing in Holland, and certainly in the US and other metropolitan societies, you do. And ID cards, this reality rating, imply a lack of trust, right, at the heart of our iron cage. You might not be who you say you are. But this book, going back to drugs, doesn't fall very easily into the neat box which distinguishes the Brave New World model from the, in Huxley from the island model, that is, hallucinations as an escapist hedonia versus hallucinations as an integrative tool that help us to become part of our society. In the first debate of the book, with an ambassador for Hoffman on one side of the table and Desiderio and the Minister of Determination on the other side of the table, the latter laments the destruction of the cathedral. He describes a serene and abstract harmony where everything moves with the solemnity of the absolutely predictable. But the ambassador's counterclaim is to prefer a malleable metaphysics which can execute desire. How much time do I have? Uh, OK, cool. So the minister, uh, he demands of the minister the absolute authority to establish a realm of total liberation. But with such a confused authoritarian rhetoric, it's not clear on which side Carter stands. Does she stand on neither? She mocks both, resulting in a faux enmity between them. The commentator Ali Smith notes that it's difficult to say whether the book is politically defeatist or liberating, for Carter walks a tightrope between radical critique of subjectivity and a politics of emancipation. Because of the resistance to closure, to the final answer, to resolution, it becomes a continual inquiry which never comes to rest in one ideological position. The trouble with this is the same as Habermas's critique of Foucault. Why fight? At the same time, where the enmity between the minister and the doctor the sh and the shifting allegiance of Desiderio were that to become more serious than it is comic in the book, we might have a book which, like the Nazi theologian Carl Schmitt, evaporates the political complexity to the existential position between friend and enemy, attacking both liberal neutralism and utopianism in favor of a metaphysics of evil where people subconsciously secularize incompatible theological ideals. Instead, in British satirical style, Carter maintains the abject absurdity by, uh, of any totalizing system, cultural or countercultural. Now to our second theme. Disintegration. The disintegration of the old is what the 60s counterculture called for. In his 1968 article, the American sociologist Theodore Rozak described the counterculture as the effort to discover new types of community, new family patterns, new sexual mores, new kinds of livelihood, new aesthetic forms than the bourgeois home and the Protestant work ethic. Hippies are unable to reconcile themselves to the stated values and implicit contradictions of contemporary Western society. This echoes Herbert Marcuse's uh, essay on liberation, where he's describing the counterculture, and he says, perhaps the kernel of truth lies in this new sensorium, but this new sensorium must be wedded to a new rationality. Even Timothy Leary at the time said, we had no comforting routines to fall back on, and in her essay, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, which I hope, if you haven't read, you will read after this, 
Joan Didion's incredible gonzo journalistic piece concludes she's in Hyde Ashbury at the peak of the summer of love, and there's a five-year-old child on acid while her mother scrambles in the floorboards for some Moroccan hash. Again, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ethnography conducted of many hippies who left the counterculture, in a, book, a really great book, Getting Saved from the 60s, Stephen Tipton realized that many hippies joined either ethically or morally stringent religious communities to make moral sense of their lives. And as Albertina tells Desiderio, in a moment of sincere irony, desire, unlike will, cannot be coerced. And she has a point. We cannot choose what to find good or beautiful. We cannot change our desire as we can with a machine. And the tragedy of the novel is that things go back to how they were before, like with COVID. The only memory to uh, we only have a memory to accompany the great experiment. And both the late Mark Fisher, God rest his soul, and the Cambridge historian Mark Riley talk about the way the Revelation Revolution sold itself out to profitable gimmicky sound bites and commodified wellness culture. The further darkness of the novel is that Desiderio is left with choosing one side of the duplicity at the heart's core, the question becoming not what is the greater truth, but what is the lesser lie? Simple personal satisfaction or the construction of a collective compromise? The friends, including Albertina, which Desiderio makes throughout, are the only warmth in this cavalcade of cold satire. And this pessimism is something which can galvanize us. Rather than looking back on a series of lonely, self-motivated, and hedonic decisions, the warmth of our life depends on the bonds we form, I guess, and how we form them. In the word of Emile Cioran's friend, I'm tired of people telling me life is meaningless. Life isn't even meaningless. <laughs> Albertina Hoffman's final soliloquy on love is at once as inspiring as St. Paul in Corinthians and completely self-puncturing and destructive. She represents everything love could be and at the same time everything love is all too often reduced to. She begins by telling Desiderio that love is the synthesis of dream and actuality. Love is the only matrix of the unprecedented. Like Shui He's paradox, the South at once has a limit and no limit. Two mirrors reflect each other and images may be multiplied without end. But the eroto energy, which motivates and, and, uh, and fuels these hallucinations, the, is considered the ultimate simplicity, but it is then revealed simply to be generated by four legs in a bed. And so such a confusion of love with the experience of the appearance of desire and the hyperemphasis on distinguishing between freedom to and freedom from, rather than looking at them both, is what makes too close an association of our hero in this world, that is the real Albert Hoffman of LSD, with the darkly diaphanous, diaphanous Hoffmans of this novel, a lesson to learn from. So how do these love slaves in the book perpetually make love? The answer is actually quite banal. We feed them hormones intravenously, says Dr. Hoffman. Moreover, while they become pure energy and eventually explode, they volunteer to do that. Or do they? This turns the phrase, I love you, into a kind of I oxytocin you. Uh, as Desiderio comments, the doctor does not know what desire is. The ideal is not measurable until someone tries to, and then always risks becoming a twisted and warped version of what drives us on. Siding with the purely equatable or the purely different and totally lying on one side without acknowledging the real barrier of the other is the bad trip. But at the end of the novel, Desiderio goes to sleep and unbidden, even though he's killed her, she appears. And if you can see the humor <laughs> in the pivot, between this sacred and profane, between the expected and the unexpected, the machine, the organic, then the charisma of an altered state of consciousness might just result 
in the being better of a possible world. Thank you.